how to help patients on a budget. That's what we'll be discussing today. It's an important topic because most people think we are heading into a recession. And I wanna do what I can to help you guys approach this on the front foot. So why don't I think you should worry about the recession? Well, there's something very different about medical aesthetics compared with many of the other things that people spend money on. It's something called the lipstick effect. It was discovered during the Second World War. And this is when lipstick sales actually at least stayed the same or went up. I can't remember which, but essentially they did really well while people were struggling to even feed themselves. And the interesting thing about this is it really highlights how important appearance is to survival. There's something I say a lot on my channel that it's not superficial. It's a very important mechanism by which we engage with people. And people do value that extremely highly, even though they don't necessarily say it out loud to all their friends. And what you'll find is that people will continue to maintain their appearance throughout the recession. But affordability and value are two things that do come into play. They will not necessarily be able to afford all the things they want, but they will still want to maintain their appearance. And that's really what today's show is all about. How do we help a patient on a budget? So the strategy here is to meet your patient's needs to the highest level possible while still playing within the limitations of affordability. So what can they actually afford? We can only do this by first elucidating what your patient's needs actually are. And this is where a good consultation should always start. And remember, needs are not the same thing as treatment requests. Many people will say, well, I want my lips doing, or I want cheeks, or I want four mils. These are all treatment requests. They are not what your patient is actually looking for. To do this properly, you need to establish what emotional needs they are hoping to meet by having that treatment. Do they want to feel more certain in different situations, more confident? Do they want to feel some variety or some difference in their appearance? Are they looking to stand out to be significant? Are they looking to just feel more confident or to get rid of a distraction that's holding them back? So why wouldn't we cut prices? Because this is often the first thing people think about. In fact, recently I was just doing a strategy day and I've been reading a lot about business strategy and I realized that many businesses take the most obvious solution first. It's not really a strategic move to cut your prices. Essentially what you're doing is saying, I haven't got any idea what to do. I'll just make my prices less. It's an attempt at shortcutting how much effort you put into thinking that actually comes up with a really bad result for your business. And it's really bad to cut your prices for one really important reason. You will absolutely be cutting your profit no matter what. You may not get more patients as a result because that's often the assumption that isn't always true. But you're instantly undermining the amount of profit you make. Now I know many independent practitioners think that profit is something that's slightly greedy. It's maybe something that they should feel guilty about making too much of. In actual fact, all businesses need profit to survive. You don't often think about profit in that way, but profit is there to protect you from the days when things slow down, when you haven't got as many patients coming in, to reinvest in research and development for new treatments or new training that you need to do in order to keep up with the continuously moving field of medical aesthetics. It's also important for unexpected things. I know we've had things happen in business that suddenly land a hundred thousand pound bill on your plate out of nowhere and you have to have had some profit retained in order to protect you from these things. So as soon as you cut prices you are instantly meaning you're going to have to do a lot more work to have the same amount of profit. So it's a really bad strategic move and definitely not something you should do as your first response to patients having less money. Instead we need to work on how do we meet our patients needs for less money but the same profit margins. There are about nine steps that you need to take and the first is to articulate with your patients what their underlying emotional needs are. I don't know how anyone can do a proper consultation without touching on the emotional needs. For me everything is built upon what they are trying to feel inside after the treatment and once you know that you can start to pull treatments in and advise accordingly to make sure that you're meeting that need. Once you understand what needs they're trying to meet, you need to understand what their aesthetic focus is. Now, everyone who comes to see you has spent time looking in the mirror, trying to figure out what it is that they would like to change. They're either looking, trying to diagnose what it is that's making them look older or less attractive, or they're looking for ways to look more beautiful, but they have spent time thinking about it, guaranteed. What they are not familiar with is all the different treatment options. This is where they need your help and guidance. So we do need to understand what they are seeing, 
but you need to also wrestle back control over what's likely to work in different situations. But it starts with understanding what it is that they see that really bugs them or what it is that they believe will make them look more attractive. Once you understand what they need and what they think is the problem, you can then offer a facial assessment. Here you are trying to look for ways to maximize their emotional needs while explaining as you go along exactly what might be associated with the words that they've used as a problem or as an opportunity. I want to look more beautiful or more feminine. You're obviously going to be drawn towards lip treatments, for example. If someone wants to look fresher or younger, it might be around the eyes. But you use your facial assessment to make them conscious of the things that you are capable of improving while observing what lights them up, what makes them look interested and inclined to actually want that treatment. Next, as you start getting into the realm of advising what treatments will work, remember to be very clear that this is a relative improvement. So we need to make it clear that we are not aiming for perfection, but we're moving in that direction. Patients are more than happy with a step in the right direction when they understand that's what they're getting and they're not getting some perfect goal. Most people are very sensible and they do understand this, but it is still worth saying out loud. So now you have completed your facial assessment, they should be aware of some of the things that you're seeing that might be related to the goal they're trying to achieve. I actually recommend that you now give them an idea of what it would cost to do everything as if they had an unlimited budget. I think it's really helpful that patients understand the spectrum of treatment. If you go in just with what you think they can afford, you quite often give them the impression that they've bought the best thing for the solution. And it's a really good idea that they know that there are other things on top of what you're recommending that might do a better job because then they understand this is not the complete answer, the A star answer, this is something that's taking budget into account. So I will give them a scary number at the far end, but I'll also say before I've got to that point that this is, this is not necessarily what they need to be happy. This is just what I might do if I was just seeing them as a technical problem and I was showing off to my colleagues, this is what I'd recommend. But we need to then work back from that to choose a number that is comfortable with everything else that they have to worry about in their lives. Primarily, I'm talking about budget here. It's also worth making your patient feel comfortable about the fact that they don't have unlimited resources because that can make your patient close up is if they think on some level you think oh they're just a poor patient i can't be bothered with them um, it's really important i always put extra effort saying you know at this time people have to worry about budget i understand that i can work towards your budget we just need to both be expecting the same thing from whatever we decide to have you can't be expecting my 15 mil solution if you've only got a budget for one mil and as long as we're on the same page we can probably find something that will make you happy. So now comes the point where you start to align the things they've told you as their biggest bugbears uh, with the treatments that you believe are likely to address those solutions while simultaneously not giving them the idea that it's the complete solution and really importantly getting them to validate that it's worth that slightly less than perfect answer. So for example I cannot completely you know, give you a cheek augmentation, but I could focus your cheeks for that. So you could have a crisper angle on your cheek, even though you don't have a full cheek that you're hoping for, it should make you look more beautiful. You then try and explain that visually so, and get them to look in the mirror, show them or show them before and after photos and get them to say, yes, that is worth it to me. I know it may not be as good as the full thing, but it seems like that will make a good difference for me. That moment of validation is really important. And if they don't seem to be responding as if that's worth it to them, you should not do the treatment. And some patients will still have it, assuming that you've said it, so it'll be good. But you're, you need them to say, yes, I believe that subtle difference is gonna make me happier. Otherwise, you shouldn't do the treatment. And most patients will actually find something that they think is worth doing. But that's a very important step to avoid disappointment. Finally, I would say never do a treatment where you have uncertainty about whether the aesthetic treatment will actually make a psychological difference. So if you look at their face and you think, you know what, I could put a half a million there, but I don't think you'll be able to see it and I don't think they will therefore be happier. Even if they say you should do it, you should not do it, obviously. Um, likewise, if you think that it will make an aesthetic difference that even that you would love to show them, but you'd have your doubts about whether that will actually make them happy because they've got much higher expectations, that's another reason not to do the treatment. Because like I always say, our real outcome is the internal transformation. They need to feel differently afterwards, otherwise you cannot do the treatment. So here are some ideas on how you can meet the needs of your patients on a lower budget. First, what can you do with less volume? 
So I mentioned earlier on about focusing versus augmenting. A lot of what we're doing with dermal filler is actually just revealing a good bone structure and underneath. And it does make a difference in certain patients just highlighting the angles. So you could highlight the angle of a chin, the gonial angle, a cheek, without doing an augmentation or changing huge amounts of detail or changing huge amounts of volume. Essentially, this is about the details. So look for little details that together, as long as your patient is aware of them, they will perceive that will make them look more attractive in a subtle way without over augmenting, but also without using large amounts of product. The next thing is to spend a great deal of time finding the area with the highest possible psychological effect. Now, the perfect example of this is in very old people. So I'm quite often seen by ladies in their 80s and 90s, and you know that they're not going to spend tens of thousands on dermal filler, but they want to look younger and fresher. And what I've discovered over the years is there's seldom a treatment that does this better than a lip treatment. So you can put half a mil into a lady's lips who hasn't seen her lips for 10, 20 years, reveal them again, she can enjoy putting makeup on again, and this can make them extremely happy with a very small amount of product. And you're always looking for those high leverage treatments. This comes across in the consultation. They will say certain things to you. They will point out certain things. They will mention their experience when they're putting on their makeup. And you're always looking for that high leverage treatment that can give you the biggest psychological impact for the smallest intervention. And lips in older people are quite often perfect for that. Next, if there is a major pain point, it can be worth putting all your attention on that. So quite often it's things that are negative for patients that they're most likely to be free of. If there was a scar, for example, that you can improve with dermal filler, which obviously you can't with all of them, that might be the number one thing to go for. Often it's a distraction, some sort of line or crease that's particularly near a major feature, like for example, near the lip or near the eyes. If you can improve it with a small amount of product, that major pain point or the big distraction that they hate most of all might be the one to go for above and beyond all the other things that may have come up in the consultation. Uh, another option is to maintain things that they've already got joy from. So we are always trying to make sure they get value out of it. And the more uncertain you are about the value that they might get, the more you could lean on previous experience. So a previous treatment that they've really enjoyed that's run out might be the thing to go for when you're not sure if they have the budget to make enough of a difference in a new area that they're discussing. The next option is once you've done your facial assessment, you would have come up with a menu of different treatments and then given them an idea about which one you think is most likely to meet their needs. But there's often a degree of a huge degree of subjectivity here and you're essentially presenting them with a menu with a cost associated with it and then allowing them to choose from that menu with your guidance. So this is the, the menu option of doing it. You give a series of costs within their budget and see which one they lean towards and then you often do another little mini consultation to remind them about the benefit they would get, get that validation from them again to make sure it's worth proceeding. And, and that's a different way of approaching it when things are a little bit more uh, nuanced. So there's no one treatment that stands out dramatically. You give them a series of options and let them choose. The next option, which many of you I'm sure have thought of, is the journey where instead of just talking about today, you think about what their budget is over the next year, because most patients already are spending a regular amount on skincare and treatments. And once you think of their budget over a year rather than in one particular treatment session, you can design a solution which maximizes their needs over the next three or four treatments. This is a really good thing to do both from your business perspective, but also from their perspective because they can then build on what they've already had and move towards their ideal goal in a much more affordable way. One more important concept to take home with you today is how do patients actually decide what they spend? Broadly speaking, there are two elements to this. The first is affordability. So how much money do they actually have to spend? And the second is the value that they attribute to that treatment. Now we cannot change affordability. Patients on the day that they see you have a fixed amount of money available, but we do influence the value in everything that we do. And this is the bit that we can control. You can increase your value to your patients in all sorts of ways. The great thing about this is this is what makes for a great practitioner, great communication skills, good experience, the ability to deliver on what you say you can do. All of those things will increase your value to your patients. Your ability to explain the impact and to justify your treatments based on what they are truly seeking rather than just being a vending machine for treatments will increase your value to patients and they will necessarily allocate more funds to something that they believe in. And this is the bit that we have control in. 
I would recommend that if we do go into a recession, you put a huge amount of your effort on becoming a more valuable practitioner. That's what my whole channel is about. So make sure you stick with me during the recession, if we go through one, which is almost guaranteed now, and we will help you in as many ways as possible to increase your value to your patients.